the abolition of the death sentence. Deputations of influential citizens visited the Premier seeking a last-minute repeal. Journalist Norman McCants recalls a story told many years later by the Premier of the day. A clergyman of, uh, of some denomination not mentioned made his way into Government House and flinging himself at the knees of the Governor uh, pleaded for intervention on the Governor's prerogative to uh, prevent the hanging of Angus Murray on the following Monday. At the appointed hour outside the prison gates, thousands of sympathisers milled, but their hymns and prayers and shouts were in vain. Murray was hanged. Taylor, as I say, was a moron, and he with uh, uh, Stokes, Buckley, and a few others, represented the flower and chivalry of the underworld. I found nothing to admire in them then, and I find nothing to admire in them now. There was one exception. The unfortunate Angus Murray, for whom I appeared when he stood trial for what was known as the Glenferry murder of a bank manager. His associate was uh, Buckley, who had disappeared. It was notorious both in the underworld and throughout the police force that as a matter of principle, Murray had never carried a loaded, I emphasize loaded, weapon in his life. The fatal shot was fired by Buckley. There is little doubt that Murray did not know Buckley was carrying a revolver, but despite an appeal to the High Court, Murray was executed. Of all these people, Murray was outstanding. Charming, gentle, sensitive man who had embraced crime as a career. I have vivid recollections of his last letter in which he wrote thanking me for what I'd tried to do for him. Stated that it was clear that he was not going to be reprieved and concluded with the following statement. There is nothing I can do for you beyond promising that I will endeavour not to forget you in that other country in which eventually the most hardened of us is compelled to believe. That was the exit of Murray. It was about this time that the police went out on strike. With not a policeman in sight, the worst elements in the community gathered in the city for a week of what one observer described as anarchy, naked, unashamed and drunken. Huge mobs of larrikins surged through the city streets, smashing shop windows and seizing what they could. Anxious businessmen boarded up their windows in panic. The rioting and looting were eventually brought under control by special constables recruited off the streets. Eventually the city was back to normal. The police department was reorganised with one of their main objectives to put Squizzy Taylor behind bars. They threw the book at him. First there was the jail plot trial. With a lack of evidence and a clever defence, the five men managed an acquittal. Then followed trial on the harbouring charge after an agonising series of remands and delays. It took three trials before a jury could be found to agree. They gave him the benefit of the doubt and again he wriggled off the hook. Squizzy battled not only in the criminal courts but in the divorce courts. His first wife alleged misconduct with Ida Pender and won a divorce. Squizzy and Ida promptly married. I was, as you may believe, at a very impressionable age when I first saw Ida Pender. She entered the court and was immediately the centre of all attraction. She was a very attractive woman, young woman, with a beautiful complexion and she was dressed beautifully. Not overdressed, but uh, held herself well and uh, conducted herself with great dignity. That is my impression of Ida Pender, who was Mrs Squizzy Taylor. Ida was a girl of 16 when they first met at a dance. 